Okay, so I'm here with Mr. Tom Riley. Um, I'm very excited to see him today. I, um, to be honest with you, I actually can't believe it's happening. Um, meeting one of my historical heroes. Um, we've had a little bit of a conversation before this. He's incredibly modest, um, but as everybody knows, and myself, uh, Mr. Riley, you do not have to be modest because your works are absolutely fantastic. So, just introduce. Um, you know yourself a little bit for me um, and what books you've written over the years um, and where you're up to at the moment sure yeah no problem but firstly I'm embarrassed and humbled <laughs> that you should say, that you should say this and um, I'm, I'm very grateful and thank you um, I I do self deprecate quite a lot because um, I kind of get off on that just to hone in on this whole historian angle and local historian and amateur historian and all that kind of stuff i am kind of very pleased that the position i'm in is an against the grain position because um when i was at school um i don't know i can't remember what second level it is over there but over here it's the leaving certificate and i would have done history at second level um which i failed and i received the wonderful mark of an f for that because I was interested in so many other things. I had no interest whatsoever in history. Now, the reason I'm saying that- was that a, I think that was an F for fantastic that time, so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, my teachers wouldn't agree with that, but thank you. <laughs> You're very good. Um, yeah, I, I, again, I, you know, I'm reasonably sane, reasonably intelligent, not, not uh, uh, any way exceptionally so at all. I'm just an ordinary Joe. Um, but what I am is I'm uh, skeptical, cynical, and I don't don't believe um, things unless I understand really the whys. I don't believe uh, everybody what everybody tells me unless I, I completely get the logic behind it. So I you know rail against the parity and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know go me. But this is kind of you know I found a place in the world where as a complete amateur and somebody who's failed history has um, discovered, and I'm 25 years in the game now, so I, I, you know, and I'm completely impervious because nobody can, can contradict me. I, I, I know this, and that's a very outlandish thing to say, but I, you know, all the best have tried, uh, and I don't make it personal. I'm not trying to be personal, but what I'm trying to say is that um, all the experts in the field, uh, who and generations of them, have been studying this period, and most of them have missed uh, this critical factor. It's a very small factor, but it's a very significant factor nonetheless. And that factor is um, that Cromwell wasn't or isn't or whatever uh, as bad as he was made out to be. The book, uh, my first uh, reasonably significant book is, was called Cromwell, An Honourable Enemy. And essentially that's what I believe he was. I believe he was honourable, he was decent, he was um, upright uh, and he was in life in general he disliked injustice where he saw it, uh, and he would have a lot of traits that a lot of people would admire. Now that, I realize, if anybody is watching this, will raise the hackles of most Irish people or people with an Irish ancestry even, because saying Cromwell is the same as saying Hitler or Mussolini or Stalin or any of those tyrants, Osama bin Laden. Um, but it's very different, and it's because people have been conditioned to think that way, um, and we've been conditioned through centuries of hyperbole, nonsense that, that we've been taught. Uh, if anybody's gone through the Irish education system, they will come out with the same opinion I had of Cromwell. Um, but what I did was um, I wiped the slate clean because I was very curious to know why did he come to my town. Uh, we didn't mention but that I'm from Drogheda, which is potentially the biggest blot on Cromwell's career. Uh, and, you know, I just read recently in a school book, and I'm going to mention the school book, uh, it's called History and Focus. It's by uh, an author called Dan Sheedy. It's published by C.J. Fallon, and it's currently on the educational, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the, the curriculum in Ireland. Uh, and a line from that book reads today um, in, in, in teaching 12 to 15 year olds that three and a half thousand inhabitants of Drogheda were killed by Cromwell, and that 4,000 people in Wexford were also killed by Cromwell. And the problem with all of this is that it is feeding 
potentially feeding um, fanatical minds. Uh, I know we're in 2022 and it's a very different climate, but simmering below the surface of most Irish people, um, that's a very general statement, but simmering below the surface of a very large amount of Irish people is an anti-English sentiment. And um, that's mainly because of the history between the two countries. But we can do without sentiment being inflamed by complete and absolute nonsense. Um, that's a long answer to the question, but essentially that's where I'm coming from. I'm an amateur who has challenged the might of academia, and academia so far are losing the game. No, and I completely agree with what you've just said, and I believe you've hit the nail on the head. Um, so, you know, the, the reason ultimately why I've invited you here today um, isn't just to talk about, you know, Cromwell and, you, and your knowledge with it's, it's it's actually about the, the figure that you are um, in regards to this subject. So I've started creating content. Um, it has only been a few weeks. Um, it's not specifically been on Crom Cromwell. It's been on a very general, you know, uh, look of British and English history. I've covered people such as Richard the um, First. I've even covered people such as William Poole, Bill the Butcher, who you know from in the 1800s, gangsters through uh, New York in America. Um, so it's quite wow. quite broad. Um, but my yeah. most popular videos, um, and I was mentioning this um, during our, our chat and correspondence via email. Um, the most popular videos have been on Oliver Cromwell, um, and they've been most popular because. I'm getting an influx of Irish men, predominantly Irish men, um, telling me how terrible I am, how I don't know what I'm talking about, and how this is an evil, genocidal so-and-so, um, and I shouldn't be admiring him, or I, sh I shouldn't even be talking about him. And it, it kind of, it went from, you know, I don't mind people disliking historical characters, that they're perfectly in their right to do that, but it was as if, they're not hating on Cromwell specifically, it's transitioned now into a general English hate. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and they're proud of being rebels, they're yeah. proud of being radical. Um, and, you know, when I've mentioned, you know, and I am very controversial, um, and I, I do admit that, and I'm very upon, unapologetically an Englishman. Um, but at the same time you know this is a great historical figure who wasn't actually as bad as what people think and I, and I don't think this hatred is actually justified um mm. you know before we we do get into the the specifics of of these things there's you know there's many eyewitness many contemporary accounts of Cromwell you know adhering to the moral code of law he you know, I believe you you've mentioned yourself in in one of your other videos where he's actually hung two of his own men for committing uh, yeah. an atrocity such as I believe it was was it stealing a couple of chickens well, it, from it a, was a minor crime, yeah. which yeah. yes, absolutely. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just just yeah, they they they're on the way to uh, Dublin uh, to Drogheda from Dublin. Uh, it's it's recorded. It's at least it's in one of the pamphlets of the day, which is where we get most of our information from. Mm -hmm. You have to be very careful, though, of course, reading these. Um, but yes, it's recorded that uh, the instructions were, the orders to his troops were um, to stay within the rules that he had laid out, the orders that he had given them. One of the orders was to um, not to do any wrong or violence whatsoever towards um, country people, in fact, or persons whatsoever, unless they be in arms or office with the enemy. So that particular example that you... you uh, mentioned there was was quite significant. Just going back to something else you said, if you don't mind, just to, to chip in um, the, you know, the individual that Cromwell was, um, and you mentioned, you know, you being English, me being Irish or whatever. Um, there is, you know, there's an element of this that that it doesn't really, you know, if, if your political background and your religious background in some instances, although maybe less so today, um, you know, and your conditioning, um, is is of an Irish persuasion at all? This is what you'll think. You'll you'll think that way about Cromwell. Now, back in two thousand and two, uh, you probably weren't born then. And uh, there was a um, a poll. Sorry for interrupting. Done. I was I was born in nineteen ninety five. So we're all we're all good. <laughs> <laughs> you look far too young. <laughs> um, there was a poll done uh, by BBC Two in 2002 and it was for i'm not sure if you're, you're aware of this but any it was for uh, great britain is an expression that's been used through throughout the century still used today 
um, but it was for the greatest Britain. And there were, uh, the top 100 was identified, and it was countrywide. It was uh, very well um, patronized by um, so many people around the country, England, obviously, or Great Britain, uh, including, I presume, Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. Anyway, the top 100 um, included, believe it or not, two Irish gentlemen who were Bono and Bob Geldof, which was very weird because they're very Irish. Um, but the top 10 uh, were uh, given a program, a documentary of their own. In other words, somebody, a celebrity in, in most cases, in all cases, uh, promoted the individual that had become, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, to actually identify the greatest Britain. Now, in that poll, Cromwell was 10th, and he uh, is looked upon by most Britons as being um, one of the greatest. Now, you know, that's a fact, and um, I'm not necessarily saying, I, I like to take the middle ground, because I'm Irish, um, you know, I I happen to have written four books and I've been responsible for a fifth as well about this guy. And I've got into so much detail. It's 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 become a minor obsession um, trying to understand the life of this guy who is an enigma. And you can look at his life and see a tyrant if you want to. Um, and you can look at his life and see a, an honourable man, which is what I have found. It's very unusual for somebody Irish to say that. Um, but anyway, just to put it in context, like th th this guy is a very divisive figure. But I think if you, which I did and had to do, um, wipe the slate completely clean, come to this with a blank canvas, take the baggage away. And you mentioned the vitriol that you've been subjected to um, online about this. <laughs> Trust me, I have been subjected to so much more I can and I imagine. get it regularly and it is vitriolic. Yeah, no, and it's, to be honest, it's actually funny that you've mentioned that because I am incredibly familiar with that poll um, about him being um, one of the greatest Britons, which I completely agree. He was one of the greatest Britons, especially in my opinion. Um, and I remember watching a video on YouTube, actually. I think it was called Cromwellian Conversations. I don't know if you've seen yes, it. Yes, yes. Um, I've seen do those, yeah. Yeah, and, and they mentioned this as well, but there was one thing that really irritated me. So one of the historians, he said, you know, Oliver Cromwell, he was actually voted as the 10th greatest Britain by, you know, one BBC poll. And then he said, the greatest Britain, whatever that means. And I just... I, it, it just angered me, but and it, you know it didn't anger me personally. But it was because, you know, this gentleman he's he's claimed politically by the left and the right. You know, he's he he was the original liberal, um, but at the same time, you know, he was a proud Englishman, and, and the right could claim him as well. But I hate it when politics yeah. is brought into history. That really yeah. irritates me. And this this historian, which he which he was, and that's perfectly fine. Um, he was a, like the greatest Briton, whatever that means. And I, I felt, I felt like jumping through the screen, going, "Well, it means the greatest Briton. It's perfectly Absolutely. fine to be a Briton, yeah, and it's perfectly fine to be great. And Cromwell yeah. is perfectly fine to be chosen as a character for this thing." So, I, I, you know, that that kind of disrespect to me. But I believe that's, you know, an inside thing, especially with the age that we're living in now, to where, you know, being proud of something or a period or a character that's looked upon negatively and you shouldn't do that and that that infuriates me because i, I yeah. want to be proud of periods and history you know? i completely agree i mean that's that's what you know some people just record history but others are inspired by it you know and there are good reasons for that often i don't know if you remember who number one was from that poll mm, was it winston churchill yes yeah yes it was Winston Churchill. So I mean, if you take the same, you know, angles that that guy is 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 uh, espousing, you know, so what does that mean? Winston Churchill was the well, greatest. Yeah, sorry. exactly. And no, no, it's fine. I'm sorry for interrupting. Um, and you know, if if we're being incredibly factual here, I don't know if you're familiar with um, Dresden in Germany during World War Two, um, especially I with you know Churchill's um, order there to literally massacre. Um, yeah. civilians and that's that's obviously looked passed upon because all the you know all the atrocities were committed by the Germans it weren't committed by you know everybody else um, so it's just funny that 
Oliver Cromwell's, you know, campaigns are picked up upon, but Winston Churchill yeah. killed probably ten times more, you know, the civilians and innocents in Germany at the time than Oliver Cromwell. But he's looked upon as a great character, and it's perfectly yeah. fine to like him. Easily, and and you know, it depends on, as you said, your politics as to how far back in time you're going to go to make a point. You know, I find that most Irish people tend to go very far back in time. Um, you know, I, I don't bring a controversial note into the conversation, but up in the north of Ireland, they go back even further, and their traditions are uh, sacrosanct. Um, and you know, it, it's it's not so much in in the south. We don't. We kind of look bemusedly, more or less, at what they you know um, want to retain and identify with and promote, and it's all about that. You know. It's 2022, you know, to me, we've got to move on. And it's not just, and um, maybe this is, you know, I don't want to keep, uh, destroy this subject and keep talking about it, but it's 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 history. You know, it's something that we, it's so long ago. Things like that, it might as well have been on a different planet. The social, religious, political, economic situation back then, it's virtually impossible for us to understand it with 21st century eyes. So, you know. Exactly. Right. And no, no, it's fine. Um, you know, and these these people who weren't alive, they they couldn't remember what happened, even if they wanted to. Um, so it's just it it's just crazy how it is. And obviously, like we was previously saying, you know, the left and the right both accept Cromwell, but I believe when you when you bring politics into history, especially modern day politics, with how you know crazy toxic and unstable our current situation is um that's where you just you, you lose it for me and you lose all credibility um because it, you know it's all about speculation and opinion then absolutely yeah i think the the, the car crash that is currently the uh, english political uh, situation is probably best avoided but <laughs> I, I understand exactly what you're saying um i think if if you go back and you know we were just talking about how far back uh, uh, um, ago this this was in time um, the complications that were at play, you know, between, you know, the, the civil war in England and the rising in Ireland and all that, like these are very significant factors and always have to be brought into a conversation about Cromwell and what he did in Ireland because the backdrop to why he came here and what he did when he came here and why he did what he did, you know, is 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 very significant. Is it okay if I just kind of outline a bit of um, bit of background of course please do yeah so um you know not to go into any great detail but you know Cromwell was a gentleman farmer up until the age of 43 made no real impression on the world other than in an agricultural sense and um, he had become an MP um, he also had fallen from grace in his hometown of Huntingdon um, and when the civil war broke out, um, he had already had difficulties with, with um, you know, the tyrants that Charles I was and the unfair taxes that he was imposing on the country and all of the other um, injustices that he was perpetrating. So, you know, when the, when the country divided, um, he was, he found, he ended up being on the parliamentarian side. So... He very quickly, I mean, from being a junior captain in, in the army, um, made significant progress through the ranks, um, primarily because he was a military genius. Nobody knows where that came from because it doesn't seem like, although there are gaps in his early years, we don't really know, but it doesn't seem like he had gone to Europe or uh, involved himself in any military engagement ever. But he just seemed to have this way that he won every battle that he was involved in. And that was, um, he believed, a Jew in the main to God and why, and, and that God was driving this and that God was on his side, like everybody at that time thought that God was on their side, although God was would, would obviously desert the losers. Um, but for some reason, um, Cromwell, and it's probably a lot to do with the way he could control men in, in terms of discipline and he was a real man's man so he you know they they would live and die with him and him with them so he had a very very uh, you know he mastered whatever it needed he needed to master to be able to uh, especially when when they were uh, attacking uh, the, ca the cavalry you know they would break up 
um, previously. In other words, you know, in early civil war battles, uh, they'd attack, and if the enemy ran, the, the cavalry would chase them down, and so the you know the opportunity would be gone for another attack. But Cromwell's um, you know whole notion was stick together, come back, we'll attack again. And there are only small aspects um, of what he did, but he he was absolutely incredible, and that's why he got the name Ironsides in battle. And of course, on the other side of the fence, um, there is an expression that um, we've often used here, and it's England's difficulty is Ireland's opportunity. So effectively, after you know years or decades of plantations, uh, the Ulster plantation being the main one, um, where uh, let's just say English people cleverly siphoned off land illegally, um, might not have been morally right, um, but uh, legally, because the crown was a very substantial factor in Ireland, and the pale was the Irish, the English part of Ireland, uh, which is where Drogheda was, uh, it was part of the pale. So anyway, there was an uprising in 1641 where um, Catholics uh, up, rose up against the Protestant settlers and basically massacred a certain amount. Now, that certain amount um, these days is usually interpreted as between four and five thousand. Um, you know, when you when you actually analyse the figures, but in those days it was exaggerated to hundreds of thousands. And stories had crossed the, the sea to England and it would have reached Cromwell's eyes and ears that Catholics in Ireland had indiscriminately massacred a poor innocent Protestants of which he was aligned to as a um, Puritan which he eventually became um, but certainly wasn't aligned to Catholicism and you can understand um, you know this because if if you look at the history of the Catholic Church um, and all of the popes who sent crusades um, you know both to the Holy Land and to France um, you know they killed indiscriminately hundreds of thousands of innocent people. So Cromwell, while he's been um, blamed uh, or accused of hating Catholics, he didn't hate Catholics and there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that he did. What he did dislike intensely was the power of the church, which is a very different thing because he saw the church as a political organization, a very dangerous organization, and they were very um, wary of anything that re resembled Catholicism coming back into England. And of course, when Charles married Catholic Henrietta Maria for France, that didn't help matters either. So essentially, you had um, an uprising in Ireland and in the English were occupied, preoccupied with the Civil War. And when um, uh, the parliamentarians won the Civil War, uh, the second civil war, by the way, because there was the first one and then there was the second one when Charles decided to be duplicitous and try and um, organize uh, the Scots uh, to um, fight against Parliament. Uh, anyway, he lost all of that. His head was chopped off for that reason. And now they had to focus on Ireland. And one of the reasons they had to focus on Ireland was because there was a very significant potential threat of an Irish army being raised to uh, knock the parliamentary parliamentarian army off their perch in London. That was militarily, that was a distinct possibility. Um, secondly, of course, when the uprising started in 1641, um, adventurers in London had pledged money for the subjugation of Ireland. So their, if you like, investments uh, had to be realized. Um, and, you know, when Cromwell did come to Ireland, it was the first time that the whole country was was uh, under English submission. He the conquest was ultimate um, after Cromwell left. So he was the first English commander ever to subjugate Ireland completely. So this is that's the backdrop, if you like, before um, he departed um, for Irish shores. Just before he did, by the way, he remonstrated with himself. He wasn't sure whether or not he should take this position as the, the leader of the uh, Irish expedition. John Lambert, in fact, was offered it first. Uh, he refused, um, but because uh, it seemed to be a poison chalice, nobody had ever conquered Ireland before. Um, and after some, you know, thinking and long nights, uh, Cromwell decided he'd take it, but he said he'd take it only on the basis that they had money and that they could pay their way through Ireland, and that's quite significant. Sammy, I'm rambling now, but that's that's quite significant. 
No, no, it's fine. It's it's absolutely fascinating to to hear you talk about it. Um, yeah, and uh, to be honest with you, I'm inclined to um, agree with Cromwell. Uh, sorry, Cromwell, with the in regards to the Catholic threat. Um, you know, at, especially at that particular time, and as you was mentioning, you know, the Crusades in 1099 when they captured um, Jerusalem, they slaughtered man, woman, child, animal. Um, when they broke through the gates. Um, that's another subject. I, I am a big fan of the Crusades, and at that particular time, I would have been on Guy de Lusignan and um, Baldwin the Fourth side, um, you know, as a Crusader myself, but that's a that's a personal one. But yeah, um, okay. and it's like I even got, um, you know, a little, a, a bit from your book, which was incredibly interesting. Um, it was paraphrased by uh, Maril, who is actually one of your biggest critics, um, it was um, a passage that Cromwell had actually said where he'd said, um, remember ye hypocrites that Ireland was once united to England. Yes. Um, Englishmen had good in- inheritances, yeah. which many of them purchased with their money. They lived peacefully and honestly among you. You broke this union unprovoked. You put the English to the most unheard and barbarous massacre without respect to age or sex that would ever be, he- be beheld. Um, and at the time when Ireland was at perfect peace, and when through the example of English industry, through commerce and traffic, um, that which was in the natives' hands um, was, was better to them than if all of Ireland had been in the hands and not an Englishman in it. Um, and yes. I believe that and, that, and that just kind of, you know, knocks the nail in the coffin for me to where, you know, a lot of this was reactionary. Cromwell was, you know, disgusted and upset with some of the things that happened, which ultimately turned his hand to Absolutely. be enforced into this conquest. Yeah. yeah. That, can I just interrupt? I beg your pardon. Yeah, that, yeah. No, just that particular uh, excerpt that you've just read is from a document that Cromwell wrote um, during the, the winter break in the hostilities, and it's absolute. It, it completely encapsulates his mindset. And I just wish so many more people in the world would actually uh, identify, you know, read this particular document and, and try and understand where Cromwell was. I mean, there, I counted them. I went through this with a forensic, you know, forensic detail. Um, there are 10 times, 10. It's a nice round figure, but it happens to be on 10 occasions in that document. He says that he's not going to go near anybody who's unarmed. 10 times. And that's a significant, hugely significant angle. Um, but also, they have, there's a book, a select, a, a volume of books coming out in November, and um, John Morrow, by the way, is, is, is uh, yes, he's one of my biggest, biggest critics, but I have huge admiration for John Morrow. He is a, a wonderful historian, and uh, I think I've said before, he'd not be into Cock Hat when it came to Cromwell, um, but not necessarily Cromwell at Bada or Wetwood, um, because he makes some um, audacious statements that I don't, just don't understand why he does it. Um, and maybe it's that there's something to do with academia where you don't knock your peers or there's some sort of reputational damage might be done by changing tack. I can say that he sent me an email when one of my books came out to say that he agreed with me that uh, civilians were not killed in cold blood, but some of them may, be killed, may have been killed in hot blood. And since that, I still have the email. Thankfully, I printed it off years ago. Um, but I, uh, I still have that, and I can, I can present that to him any time. But since that, he's changed his opinion, and, and he seems to have they, the, the historians in general have closed ranks on the likes of me, especially me, and, and decided not to accept um, several things that I say, which is incredible. Um, you know, because it's very hard to argue with the facts. Um, anyway, sorry, I lost the train of thought there. No, it's no problem, and it's fantastic. And I do apologise again. I'm going to have to use your book one more time because even though I'm thoroughly enjoying this conversation, it's also for my viewers um, who don't always agree with me, um, and I can't sit here and unfortunately read one of these books to them um, and have them attentively listening to me. So I, I would love to just add this in. There was another one in your book where he said. Banishment would only be used to commute the sentences of those guilty of capital offences. Estates would be confiscated only from those who had taken part in the massacres or taken up arms in defence of the rebellion, and those laying down their arms would be given merciful consideration. Yeah, and and you see, this to Heller to Connacht um, statement that he's alleged to have made, which he never did because it's not documented anywhere, it's just a phrase that emanated from the time, 
you know, most if you just um, ask and put a microphone in front of you, do a vox pop in this country anywhere, uh, and everybody will know who Oliver Cromwell is, by the way. He's a household name. Not so much in England, but he certainly is in Ireland. Um, they will tell you that he killed as many Catholics as he could, and he shipped the rest of them to Connacht on, or, or, or on pain of death. Now, that's complete drivel. And as you rightly say, in the early stages of the Cromwellian settlement, plantation, whatever you want to call it, those were the directives that, that they were working under. But if you had taken the side of the king, and you knew by taking the side of the king that if you lost, your, your, your land could easily have been forfeit, um, and you did lose, but that, that's what happened. And it was landowners. It wasn't the ordinary people, the, the, the peasants, the, the, the farmers, the solicitors, the, you know, the, uh, all the other professions that I just can't think of right now. It was people who had land who lost their land because they took the side of the king. And banishment, um, you know, there, there are, after Drogheda, when, um, and we haven't even got into that yet, but when there were some soldiers um, that they sent to Barbados, um, because they decided not to kill them, which they had every right to do because of the rules of war at that time. Um, and of course, these soldiers more than likely weren't weren't local. They were royalists who had been placed there by by Ormond, kind of a ragtag uh, army of sorts. Um, but you know, from that particular statement that Cromwell makes in his letter, I have heard through the years that that there were so many inhabitants of Grada who were taken and placed uh, and sent to Barbados as slaves. Now, if you don't mind, I just one, one other thing on Cromwell's document that you just read there. Um, I believe that uh, there's, there's, a, there's a volume of, of I was just about to say, there's a volume of uh, books coming out. Uh, there have been two previously. Carlyle had his letters and speeches um, back in the 19th century, and uh, William Cortez Abbott also in the 1930s produced um, Cromwell's letters and speeches. But this is a new one that's coming out in November, the 30th of, of November, uh, 2022, if anybody's listening to this after the debate. And um, it's the writings, the letters, writings and speeches of Oliver Cromwell. But I believe that in that uh, volume, um, they found an even earlier version of that particular document that we've just been talking about that he wrote in Yachal in Ireland during the winter. So I'm intrigued. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm intrigued to see uh, what that version says. And I... And I bet that it emphasizes even more um, that civilians were not to be in, included because it seems that even even the document that, that you've quoted I, I would have you know been 95 percent 99 percent convinced that they were Cromwell's words word for word but it seems you know if you weren't there and you didn't see him writing it down maybe they all weren't maybe it was a version of that document that most people wanted us to read but fundamentally they've always been treated as Cromwell's words and um, I'm just intrigued as to what this new document will say. Yeah that's going to be absolutely fantastic so um, please if you don't mind share it with me if you uh, when when it comes out because no yeah. doubt no doubt you'll be the front line ready for that one. <laughs> it's pretty um, expensive. <laughs> yes I will. And um, so just going back onto the you know the, the settlers um, in, in Ireland what is your opinion on that because I as a very common Northern Englishman, very controversial, I do enjoy an argument from time to time. Um, yeah. I have argued with Irish, with Irishmen that, um, yeah, I know, right? Um, that you know, the Irish being the most successful immigrants on the planet, um, a Paddy's Irish pub in every town, in every <laughs> country, country on, on the planet. You know, whenever I go on holiday and I want to yeah, feel safe or. You know, I'm, I'm straight there. And I've even picked up upon this, especially in the 1800s, um, with the Irish immigrants in New York influencing, you know, the political stance and yeah. the votes and everything. And, and also the organised crime was predominantly from Irish gangs. Um, yeah. And I just I just kind of said to him, is that's that's almost permissible. It's almost admired. It's fine. But these settlers in Ireland, why are these particular immigrants looked upon so harshly and, and so terribly and I just want to I just want to know what your opinion is on that or the facts of it yeah I think I think there were several factors at play back then um, like for instance it would have been the you know the way that the land was um, usurped um, by the English it, as I said earlier 
it w- wasn't morally right. Um, that you know, the, uh, and of course, when you add in the religious um, angle as well, because while religion always didn't create the boundaries for people, sometimes it influenced participants. So um, you know, I, I think there were a few spicy um, you know dimensions to to what happened. And if you're discommoded or dislocated from the land that you own and your family has owned for years and maybe even before that where the clans because the clans in Ireland owned the land there was a situation where Brehan Law was in vogue here where it was you know it was kind of everybody's land it didn't really make any difference uh, if you were involved in I, I'm O'Reilly so I would have been from Cavan the O'Reilly's we would have owned that land as a clan um, and Brehan Law was, was very complicated it was very um, you know uh, detailed um, but when the English came along and saw Ireland, we were always going to be a target, obviously because geographically we're right next door. Um, and this was what, and again, I'm not judging, um, you know, this was what, because you can't judge because it's so long ago. And this is what uh, England, you know, some never sets on the British Empire, we've had that so many times. Um, but they always had trouble taking Ireland. So while, so the settlers always, resi- sorry, the inhabitants, the, the uh, Irish themselves, always resisted um, any kind of oppression back in those days. And when you throw in religious and land and cultures and, and everything, it, be, it becomes incendiary. incendiary. So um, I, I think basically that's why. Um, and as well as that, um, you know, there was, there was a very, and you can see it too, you can see where, um, you know, when, when English people come over, they would be very... Uh, potentially dismissive of customs. Um, you know, you have seen language, um, you know, for instance, from those days, Cromwell said he, at one stage, he'd rather be overrun by a Scottish interest or a cavalierish interest than an Irish interest. Um, there was a particular way, uh, I'm going to avoid using the word savage, but, you know, way that English people would have looked at Irish people at that time. Um, but, you know, we didn't have the the resources that that England had to become a compatible country economically, um, so you know you throw all these into the mix, and I think that's that's why it was so bad. No, I, I completely agree. Um, and as you'll see on the video, if you if you do watch it back, um, because just so the viewers know, Mr. Tom Riley unfortunately can't see me today, but he will be able to see me um, on the video. I've actually got a shamrock tattooed, branded on my arm, um, as I do have Irish ancestry myself, um, so I'm definitely not an island hater. Um, but at the, at the same time, um, the English, it's its just unfortunate for the rest of the planet. Um, when it comes to war, when it comes to fighting, when it comes to co- conquest, we're just, we're just number one, and it's just one of them very unfortunate um, facts that everybody just, you know, kind of has to agree with and come to. Um, yeah, there's, that, there's that guy, Al Murray, I don't know if you've ever seen that, um, there's a programme that he did, um, Why Does Everybody Hate the English? I don't know if you've seen that. No, no, I've not seen it, but I can almost tell you the, already tell you the answer, but please tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So it's it's in that it's in that area. Yeah, the, like they 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 do a program on different countries, and they did did one on Ireland. And of course, they they came to Drogheda and looked at Cromwell. They didn't talk to me, mind you, but that's okay. Um, lots of people have opinions on Cromwell. But look, there's no point in you and I sitting here talking about what happened with the the British Empire years ago. It's a fact. It's a historic fact, and that's just what we have to deal with and look back. And if there are people that we should blame for things like atrocities, well then that's fine, blame them. Don't blame, blame Cromwell or don't blame people who didn't actually commit these things when others did. Exactly, I completely agree. And at the same time, if we're talking about the British Empire, some of the British Empire's greatest warriors were Irish, Welsh and Scottish, um, as they, you know, they made up the predominant amount of the front line. Um, you know, sneak, sneaky little terrible thing by the English there, so I do apologise. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we're English and we, we don't change. Um, but, yeah, you know, yeah. The, some of the greatest regiments that we've had have been, you know, the Irish and the Scots. Um, and they've had a great contribution. And, and I thank the Irish, the Welsh and the Scots for the contribution that they had because they allowed us to create the greatest empire that has ever lived. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, Ireland was part of the British Empire right up until you know the 1920s. So that's that's a thing. And when the 
You know, the Easter Rising happened over here in 1916. There was a complete, um, you know, conundrum with people who were fighting, Irish people who were fighting in the war, World War I, um, and, you know, the, the conflict, I mean, not just for people's consciences, and, you know, we're trying to overthrow the English yoke, and it was, the, the Rising was seen as, um, you know, a complete and absolute disaster until... And General Maxwell decided to execute, execute the leaders, and of course everything flipped on its head at that stage. Um, but anyway, we're going into the, the rising. We could talk about so many aspects, but I just want to make one point clear. And if you are editing this, I'd like you to keep this part in, because um, I am extremely passionate of where, where I come from. I'm exceptionally patriotic. I, like you, have a tattoo, and it says Ireland, and it says Drogheda, and where I'm from. And I know the words of the national anthem, which are in Irish. I know I understand them. I can speak reasonable Irish, um, possibly unlike um, a lot of the, the, the detractors who might come online and give out about the kind of things I say. Um, but I don't believe for a second that that's got anything whatsoever to do with this um, huge, huge miscarriage of historical justice. And that's exactly how I see this. Terrible things happened, and I can't and won't condone them, but let's blame the people who did it. Exactly, and I completely agree. I couldn't have said it better myself. Be proud of, to be Irish, be proud to be English, and do not apologise for that because it's a fantastic thing with a fantastic history. Um, okay, so if we continue talking about this, Tom, I'll unfortunately be taking up 10 hours of your day, so let's, let's get on to the, the proper subject. So we've got the yeah. Irish campaign, 1649. Um, let's start in Drogheda. The you know the the number of people that is recorded to be killed was three thousand five hundred. They say um, two thousand seven hundred of them being actual royalists. Um, and I believe that there was a big um, you know parliamentarian settlement already there in Drogheda. Is that correct? So I'm going to give you the background, and I we, don't worry. We'll end up at the figures. If I go down a cul-de-sac or rabbit hole, stop me because. Um, you know, there's so many, like when you ask me that question, you know, it's, it's like I'm ticker taping and you're going, G -g 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 what will I, how will I answer this? So it's very important to give a background to Drogheda. And it's very important to understand that this wasn't essentially um, a quintessential Irish town. This was a town within the English part of Ireland. It was a town where English parliaments had been held. It was a town where in 1641 the Irish had circled um, in order to try to take from the English um, during that rising. Um, and it was a town where people, everybody, the municipal administration, looked to London for direction, not Dublin, not anywhere else. So it's, while geographically it's in Ireland, and you can argue we've just done that, or discussed all the, the ramifications of the implications of how it got to this stage, it was at this stage. Mainly Protestants, inhabitants, uh, tenaciously Protestant, in fact, there may have been a small cohort of Catholics living in the town. So, when Cromwell arrived, I, I, I'll change that and I'll start that sentence again. When Cromwell swung his legs out of bed to make the journey to Ireland, which was the 11th of July, 1649, the previous day, Drogheda had been delivered up to the Royalists. So he's parliamentarian, but for two long years before that, Drogheda was under parliamentarian rule. My point there is that had he decided to come two weeks beforehand, four weeks before, and three months, two years, whatever it is, he would have been able to walk into Drogheda with no problem whatsoever, and he would have been treated as a as the general that he was, and he would have been given the respect that he deserved because the uh, the garrison there were parliamentarian his party but this isn't well known and people may be listening to this going well, that can't be true why would that's ridiculous but it's absolutely the case and the facts show it now these parliamentarian the, the, the garrison that was there obviously for two long years you're interacting with the local populace so these are inhabitants who are selling milk selling beer and um, engaging in commerce uh, you know they're socializing uh, all of that time and we also know that one of the regiments that were in that was in Drogheda on the day the royalists took it back was the 10th of July 1649 
was the regiment of Colonel Michael Jones. Now, Colonel Michael Jones, when Cromwell came, his regiment attached itself to Cromwell's new model army, the, the, the contingent that he had in Ireland. So now you have those guys, potentially, who had been there for two years, had just been ousted by the, by the Royalists on the 10th. And they, some of them even changed sides, by the way. Some of the Royalists became parliamentarians. Um, that particular day because yeah, why not you know pay more money maybe there's more food there it, it, it was really a, a, you, know, you change sides at the drop of the hat certainly even some generals did like Lord Inchiquin that's another story but um, so uh, some of the soldiers in the regiment of Colonel Michael Jones could easily have been in Drod for two years in a couple of months time when Cromwell gets his act together and they're outside the walls of Drada they're sitting there trying to get back in. Now, I suppose the point again I'm making about this is how ridiculous is it that when they got in that they just decided to run, run them up and kill all these people, especially when the orders were against them. So again, so that's, that's part of the backdrop. We also know that when Cromwell arrived in Ireland that he did two significant things. He put up a, um, a, a poster, let's call it, or whatever it is, it's a, cert- it's a declaration be printed and, and, and promulgated countrywide to say that he's here and he's not going to do what all of the other armies have been doing in Ireland uh, for the last nine or ten years, which is just stealing corn, taking cattle when they wanted to. He, he had the money, which is what I said, he didn't want to leave England before, before he had about 120,000 pounds, which was huge money, huge money in those days. An army marches on its stomach. And Cromwell knew this. And again, all of these are major factors. You don't hear people talk about these when you hear people talking about Cromwell in Ireland. But this is what he knew. He knew men and he knew they had to eat. And he knew if he was going to be sitting down outside the walls of any Irish town, towns where they had lots of food stored, where they had a huge advantage. I mean, think about it. I'm hungry now. <laughs> you know, think about sitting there. What are you going to do for your breakfast, your dinner, your tea, however, you know, whatever way you look at it? They had to be fed. So Cromwell, one of the first things he did was, I'm here, I'm going to pay for food. So you had the country people flocking to the Cromwellian army at every stage. And that's why when two men stole hens from an old woman, he had them hung as an example to the rest. Because that the orders were very clear. But the second order that he said, that, that was incredibly clear, I mentioned it early on in the conversation, is where he instructed his army on, on pain of death not, not to, to do, do any wrong or violence, or violence, and I'm quoting, quoting verbatim now, uh, to, to any, any persons, persons whatsoever unless they be in arms or office with the enemy. enemy. And and that's, that's very clear. Very, very clear. clear. So, so these, these are the things. You have essentially an English town, I'm exaggerating for effect. You have orders and you have an honourable individual who is at the helm. Now, also in Drogheda at this time, you had a civilian population who had been subjected to a siege in 1641 when the Irish attacked the town, and that took five months to go away. But during those five months, um, the town was reduced to uh, eating cats, dogs, horses, rats, whatever they could find, because the Irish prevented food getting in. They lifted the siege when a ship eventually made its way up the Boyne and crossed in full of full of their uh, supplies and they knew okay the town has supplies now so we, we we might as well just go because they couldn't break through the walls because they didn't have the firepower so it was all about waiting and you know trying to flush the the, the, the defenders out so the point about that is that um ormond who was cromwell's chief adversary in ireland he issued a decree at Drogheda to the people of Drogheda. Uh, or to the governor there, Arthur Aston, and he said, get rid of mouths that I don't need to feed. Get rid of them. Superfluous people who are not the army, in other words, in brackets, I've got food, they had food that they figured that the army would last, this is the Irish, the, the royalist army in, in Drogheda would last about nine months. They had victuals, what they called victuals, for nine months. So why would they want... So the population at that time of Drogheda was about 3,000 people, and the, the, uh, the defending army was about 3,000 people as well. So what Ormond said was, let them out, we don't need to be feeding them as well. For my my um, suggestion, and there's a Dean Nicholas Bernard, who was a rector at St. Peter's Church in Drogheda. His family and children are documented as having left the town. 
Now, we, now we don't have an awful lot of eyewitness documentation about other people who left, but you can be found sure that they were either thrown out or they left. Another aspect of what we do know about the civilians in Drada is that there was a, a group of them who wanted to allow Cromwell in, not because they figured he was going to kill everybody, because they were on his side. A lady called Lady Wilmot, uh, she spearheaded this, and she was banished to a place called Monster Boys, which is probably where all of the other um, uh, civilians went as well. That general direction, maybe to monasteries around the area. Um, I, I know I'm, I'm sounding very passionate about this, but I'm trying to give you a background to draw that, that people don't tend to articulate. This is not a quintessential Irish town that Cromwell came to and had motive to to kill the, the, the inhabitants. The final thing I'll just say before I let you back in is that um, Ormond, when he was issuing his instructions to Aston, he also said, and this is in the moderate Intelligencer, which was John Dillingham's um, paper, newspaper at the time, it was called a newsbook, which was virtually the Times, it can be believed, almost... Um, you know, um, fully. Uh, I, I'm just saying that because I'm struggling for words. But you know, there were lots of um, uh, propaganda, lots of stuff that was that was printed. But but Dillingham was quite um, good in the way he reported stuff. So we know that he wasn't a hack. He just printed stuff willy nilly. Anyway, he says that Ormond. Um, uh, made sure and, and actually used the words that there were lots of men in the, in, he said in that kingdom which meant that area, who had taken up arms against Cromwell. And this also is kind of new and it's kind of something that, that you can't ignore. And my point about that is is that the defenders now consisted of royalists who had been in Ireland anyway, royalists who had come over after the English Civil War, and royalists uh, who were in the town and sided with the king. And the key thing about this is, can I call you Marcus, by the way? Of course you can, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> The key thing about this thing is, Marcus, is that all of these people weren't fighting for any Irish Republican cause. They were fighting for their precious King of England. So, you know, Republicans these days don't fully get that. Um, anyway, that's the background. So, so and, and when it comes to the, the, the aftermath of Drogheda, and when there are words stuck onto a letter, which we we'll talk about in a second, uh, three little words that say uh, also killed were many inhabitants. Of course they were, because they were in arms. Anything else is speculation, and there's no evidence for it. No, I completely agree. And just to you know, paraphrase what you were saying, and that's just that's that resonates with me to where if the you know the the foundation of your army is keeping it fed, keeping it supplied. Why would you then kill the shopkeepers, the farmers, you know, the grocers? Why would you kill these these people who are absolutely fundamental to the success of your army? At the same time, if your commanding officer, Oliver Cromwell, has said he will kill you if you harm innocents, why would you then, on top of that, go to do it? Um, I just, I find it absolutely in, in, insane that this just, you know, this this can't be accepted by people. And this, you know, and this is known and, and I knew about this as well. Um, yeah. And I just, I, I find it absolutely insane. Well, the, 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 you know, so far we've, we've, and it's a reasonably very interesting general conversation that we're having here, but there are very specific um elements are, are, are of evidential platforms that you need to analyze when you're talking about all this. In other words, you know, I've looked at the, the, the accounts of Drada by everybody who was there. I've looked at the accounts of Drada, everybody who wasn't there and um, wrote about it anyway. And I've obviously looked at accounts of Drada in the subsequent years. So a very um, distinctive pattern comes out of all of this rather than getting into all the individual uh, pieces of evidence. Firstly, there is, with the exception of one, there is no eyewitness who gives us details of civilian deaths at Rada. But that's kind of remarkable. As I mentioned before, you've got a school book that's telling you 3,500 inhabitants were massacred by Cromwell. No ambiguity there. So, 
That's a fact. Only one eyewitness gives us details of civilian deaths. And I am so happy to have been the one to have completely dispelled, dispelled, dismissed, denigrated, blown completely out of the water that particular eyewitness because that's a guy called Thomas A. Wood. Thomas A. Wood was a Cromwellian soldier. Came over, was in the army, he, he uh, attacked Rahada and he allegedly says that they used children as a buckler of defense or a shield and that they, he relates uh, an incident about a, uh, what he calls a virgin who was wearing costly apparel whom they stole the jewels from and threw her, killed her and threw her over the wall. Um, so that's a very specific um, uh, story. But... <laughs> I was so happy because I had a lot of trouble with this. I went for years thinking, what about Wood? What if Wood says this? How can you just dismiss Wood because you want to? I don't dismiss stuff because I want to. I dismiss stuff because it's complete nonsense when I just when when it's established that it's complete nonsense. So the 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 Wood uh, evidence uh, was came down to us from a book that's called The Life of Anthony Wood. Uh, written by himself. Now, Anthony Wood happens to be Thomas's brother, and uh, when you look at that book, you also realise that it wasn't written by himself because he didn't write it, but that's the way it, it was um, uh, portrayed at the time. Um, it was uh, written by, he died, he was an Oxford antiquarian, and he um, wrote a lot of stuff about Oxford luminaries. And when, uh, on his deathbed, he bequeathed um, various uh, diaries and writings and documents that he had uh, to a Dr. Tanner, who, um, you know, involved other people. Um, but the point I'm trying to make here is that now we've got loads of hands in a, in a, in a, in a Cromwell um, attack. Uh, verbal attack and that particular book wasn't even published till get this 123 years after the events so let's say we have some sort of weird um, courtroom where Cromwell's sitting there and the evidence is well we've got one eyewitness my lord and okay present your eyewitness there he is uh, well no it's his brother well, hold on a second it's, it's this guy Tanner well actually there's somebody else involved and you know what it came out 123 years after the judge is going to say, oh my God, come on, you know, so that's the point. The point is that anybody could write what they wanted, um, but without, uh, and, and you take all these specific elements of evidence, like I say, the orders, the, the civilians, there's no motive, not just for the soldiers, but for Cromwell to, to even harm, because this is an English town, this is what I'm saying, it's an English town. Okay, if you were on the royalist side, you might have trouble with your land or your property because that's what the, the, the directive was. But there's no motivation whatsoever for any of the attackers to put the hair on the head of any of the, of any of the inhabitants or the defenders. Sorry, the inhabitants of Drada. Of course, I realise, because I'm not a complete idiot, that this is a war situation. So arbitrarily, bullets, well, musket balls are flying through the air, as are cannonballs. And it's absolutely the case, I'm sure, I'm speculating now, that um, a handful of civilians, and again I'm speculating on the word handful, um, who may have stayed in the town, um, were killed. But I can tell you now, that was by accident as opposed to by design. Yeah, no, and it's fascinating. Um, and I believe that this is a problem of a lot of historians nowadays where they write history books off of other historians who have written history books. They mm -hmm. aren't going themselves getting that eyewitness account. And ultimately, of course, there's loads of great historians who have written history books who have used, you know, essays and works from other historians, which are fantastic. But at the same time, if I'm being incredibly honest... Um, and I'm acting like a Puritan here. I want to know the truth and I want to know what happened from eyewitness accounts or, you know, the, the best contemporary yeah. accounts we can get. And at the same time, yeah. um, you're completely right as well with that. Um, if anybody is familiar with war, they know that war is not perfect mm -hmm. and civilians can be killed either wrongfully or on accident. And that is just a fact of law. Uh, sorry, a fact of war, sorry. But at the same mm -hmm. time, um, inhabitants who were originally civilians and originally innocents, as soon as they pick up arms, unfortunately, they, they, they have just lost all that innocence and all that civility. They become a civilian you know, who picks up an arm. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I beg your pardon, Marcus. A civilian who picks up an arm is no longer a civilian. 
um, you didn't have to, you know, go go down to the local um, military office and sign in forms and, you know, you get, get measured and get your hair cut. You just basically picked up a sword. Now you're a threat. Now you're a civilian. And, and that happened regularly. So, so when... When Cromwell wrote, um, can we can we just get into just going to get into that particular area now about the the documentation um, subsequent to the siege? Um, do you know what I'll do? I'll just go through the siege. So it, when they arrived before the walls of the town, two breaches were made in the walls. The the third assault was was uh, led by Cromwell. They got into the town um, overnight, and um, all of the defenders that they found in arms. Uh, which is what the order that Cromwell gave was that they were to be killed. Now, this is something that didn't happen in previous battles in the Civil War. It certainly happened in Europe in, during the Thirty Years' War. There are lots of examples of that. Um, Magdeburg being one particular one, but of course they went beyond that too and killed civilians there. But, um, but this is the key thing. It's, it's it's like, like I mean you know it's it's a it was a thing that they that Cromwell did he he massacred in cold blood the the defenders of Drogheda and that in itself um, you know I, I'm not going to call it an atrocity a war crime because he it was within the accepted rules of war at that time because an attacking army if a defending army chose to refuse to surrender well everybody knew that their lives were forfeit and um, because it was the rules of war because the, the logic was that if you're if you're outside a town you were much more likely to lose your you know significant parts of your army because they couldn't be fed easily whereas inside you could be so that's what the rule of war was but the thing was Cromwell carried it out and I'm only saying that to emphasize the gravitas of what happened and how through the centuries that massacre became a massacre of civilians because that's what children are be taught today um, or how it, you know, over the years if there were some civilians or whatever it is but civilians are thrown in and a lot of the reason is because of that sentence at the end of a list that's appended to Cromwell's letter at the, that, he that he wrote back to Parliament on September the 17th after the siege, the siege um, because, because he, he uses the expression, I beg your pardon, I'm going to say that again, somebody, somebody uses the expression and many inhabitants. inhabitants. Now again, now again because, because I'm so cynical, cynical I, I looked at this particular, particular pamphlet, I realised realize that the letter that Cromwell wrote doesn't exist, uh, like, uh, like with a quill and ink on vellum. vellum. What exists, what exists is a pamphlet that Parliament printed in a hurry, because we know a lot of this stuff, and it was a 16-page pamphlet, and his letter is in that. But on in gaps where the letter finishes, there's a list that's appended of those, those slain at Drogheda. Now, there's no evidence whatsoever to imply that Cromwell wrote that list himself. It doesn't really make any difference, because somebody did. And at the bottom of that list, it gives the generals and the... You know, from, you know, from the different regiments, and it mentions really be significant royalist defenders who died, uh, reporting the news a bit, basically. And at the end, it says, and many inhabitants. Uh, and as I've said earlier, inhabitants were armed, so that's the end of that story. Why would you just extrapolate that and decide that these are innocent civilians? <coughs> Excuse me. No, and I completely agree, and thank you very much for you know that fantastic talk on that. Um, with, with your permission, um, are we okay to move a little bit on to Wexford now um, to see what happened yeah, there? Yeah. Um, I think so. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to think, have I done everything on, on, on Drogheda? Um, uh, I'm just going to give you another couple of... Um, Context about Drogheda, if that's okay. Of course. Listen, I'm conscious of your time here, Tom. I'm no, 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 free no, all don't. day, so don't worry. But you just continue. Me too. That's okay. okay. That's, that's no problem. problem. No. So just, so just um, the, Drogheda the Drogheda thing. thing. So, so if you look at the people who were in the town at that time and the people who wrote about it, like I mentioned, Inchiquin, who was a parliamentarian officer. I mentioned Ormond who was uh, the leader, if you like, of the Royalist Army in Ireland. Now, they wrote letters um, about what Cromwell did at Drogheda, but none of them mentioned civilian fatalities. And, you know, you think if they happened that, my God, somebody would say something. And um, so what happened was, when the news 
reach drive. Sorry, there's also another piece of information that, you know, one of the things that I did that very few people did was I hightailed it up to the local corporation office to see what details were there from 1649 in, in the Drahada uh, records. And, of course, there's the names of hundreds of people who were going about their daily business. There's, there's a very cursory mention of the siege. And why would they be bothered about it? Because they were effectively on Cromwell's side, effectively. He wants it. Okay, now we're under Parliament again. We were under the Royalists and we were under Parliament. We're under Parliament again. Let's just keep going with, with, with life in general. And that's what they did. So, but uh, by October, uh, there are uh, news books coming out, being printed in London. And of course, again, you've got the two sides. You've got the Royalists and the Parliamentarians. You've got licensed news books and you've got unlicensed news books. So if you had enough money and you had the wherewithal, you could just find a printing press, find a printer, you'd call yourself a, 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 an editor and print what you like. And this is another uh, element of, of just the Drogheda thing because two royalist hacks whose names we know and whose affiliations we know and whose hyperbole we're very familiar with uh, decided to say at that point in time, which was October 1649, that civilians were killed at Drogheda, 2,000 of them. One of the guys says his name is John Crouch, and he printed The Man in the Moon. And there was another book called Mercurius Elenticus, and that was by a guy called George Wharton, who also decides to back in Cromwell's name. But again, this is October 1649, and it's, you know, you might say, well, oh my God, why are you dismissing that, Tom Riley? Why does that not, you know, just categorically say to you that civilians were killed? Because these guys used to sit, and we know this because people of Jason McGilligan, who's done a, a PhD on, on print in the 17th century, tells us that these guys sit in the pub and make up all sorts of lies and calumny, whatever they could think of, to Black and Cromwell's name. So, but the point I'm trying to make, and it's a very significant point, is that that's um, October 1649. So, and again, you know, we're only a month after the events. And effectively, nobody, with the exception of these two lunatics, say that Cromwell killed civilians. So we go through the whole of 1649, we go through 1650, 1651. It's not until 1660, which is 11 years later. That's a long time in anybody's life that people decide to say that civilians were killed at Drada and now it's becoming popular. And that's because at the at, in, in 1658, Cromwell died. 1659, uh, Richard Cromwell, the second protector, um, uh, tumbled down. He was called Tumble Down Dick. And uh, the monarchy was restored. So it was open season on everything. Cromwellian, the Republic, it was wiped off the... the, the um, um, the earth, the earth what what the, the republic had done and what it stood for um, and, and of course that's, that's when it's it's all, all of these uh, scurrilous allegations come into play, into play. And, and you know again, again they're, they're not, not what, what you would call it's not, it's contemporary, not contemporary evidence because it's not from 1649 and it's not from an eyewitness Oh, no, and you've got to be incredibly careful because especially with what you've just mentioned this is just classic royalist propaganda um you know in england has been under and and britain as well um it's been under a monarch for its entire history um and when that unbelievable act of having charles the first's head chopped off actually happened the commonwealth of england forming um you know oliver cromwell becoming the lord protector england turning into a republic that was absolutely revolutionary um, yep. And the royal family wanted to make sure that that never happened again. So anybody who was contributing to the royalist propaganda was encouraged to, you know, the, the, the absolute highest form. Any negative you could say about that period, the Republic, Oliver Cromwell specifically, um, that was encouraged. And even to the disgusting act of, you know, digging Oliver Cromwell back up and yep. posting his head on a spike. I um, mean, it was ultimately to try and say 
this will never happen again and everybody who likes this is a bad person and you should hate this. <laughs> that's, that's so true. And, and of course all the regicides were hunted down and uh, you know either uh, hung, drawn and quartered or, or but some of them managed to get away as we know. But yeah, but it, interestingly, and you reminded me of something, even in 1663, one of Cromwell's major royalist detractors was a guy, was a guy called uh, James Heath who wrote um, uh, a, a biography, shall we call it, in inverted commas, of Cromwell, and he decides to say that 300 women were killed around the cross at Wexford. Now, the, the point I'm making about that is that he never says anything about civilian deaths at Trahada because he just didn't, because obviously it didn't happen, but he just makes a point about talking about Wexford. We may well dovetail into that now, if that's okay. Of course, yeah, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. 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 So, Wexford so Wexford is a very different kettle of fish altogether, um, or kettle of sharks, as we say over here. So when um, when Cromwell set his sights on the country, um, he focused on Munster. He had obviously got the gateway to the north now, because Brad effectively was, again, we didn't really mention this, but from a military um, point perspective uh, in, in terms of strategy, um, he now had a gateway on the east side to the north, and uh, that was uh, very um, obviously important that he did that. So now he needed to, you know, he was going to go down and take Munster, um, and of course there were lots of towns, including Cork, uh, the city of Cork, and lots of towns down there who were already pro Cromwell, and they simply delivered their towns up the Cromwell. Again, not something you're going to get taught uh, in Irish schools, you know, because um, it's just not, you know, the done thing. So so he had friendly, um, you know, he, he, st he stuck to mainly friendly areas, to be honest. So anyway, but Wexford was no drama. Wexford was a very different proposition altogether. Wexford was an essentially quintessential Irish town. And, uh, you know, to sort of uh, synopsize Wexford, the, when they arrived at the walls of Wexford, Cromwell hadn't intended for a second on any, um, uh, on repeating the same uh, military action uh, by killing all the defenders um, because he uh, uh, engaged with the governor. Uh, Discussions, the dialogue was very cordial um, because we have all the letters that, that they wrote from one to the other, one to the other. So they were negotiating terms, basically. And it seems that maybe Senate, who was the governor of the, of the, um, of the town, was um, buying time to see if Ormond would bring his army down and, you know, um, uh, occupy Wexford. Then Ormond didn't do anything of the sort. He never met Cromwell even in the field. In, in, in Ireland. So anyway, so there were about um, 1,500 defenders of Wexford. Um, now, the point about this is that um, we know for a fact, because the uh, news books tell us that a lot of the defenders of Wexford were townspeople. It seems that an awful lot more of the um, locals um, decided to take up arms against Cromwell. And you can understand this, because this was a town that was on the coast of Ireland. It was uh, well known for piracy, um, attacking English ships. There's two sides to every story. I'm sure that like hostages were committed on the English side as well. As we know what I'm just saying, from a Wexfordian point of view, uh, it was a nest of piracy. Had done damage for years. There were stories again in the in the uh, rising that they had committed atrocities to um, Protestants, which hadn't happened at Drogheda because they were mainly Protestant. And so, so again, two very different towns, although they are lumped together. But in 1649, they're chalk and cheese. Anyway, um, make a long story short, um, Cromwell. Sorry, they even the, the townspeople and the governor even sent out beer. Uh, and and snacks to, to Cromwell because they had tents and, and Cromwell even mentioned that their tents weren't as good a cover because the, the rain, the weather was bad in Ireland uh, as their houses and uh, he complained about that so Simmons sent him out some snacks. Um, anyway, um, but what happened was there was a captain, that there was a castle adjacent to the town walls, a little bit separate, but kind of adjacent, and um, there was a captain of the, the guy who was in control of that was a guy called Stafford, and either um, due to treachery or due to incompetence, he relinquished control in some way of that castle. And of course, once the Cromwellians had the castle, 
um, the town followed very quickly. So it probably was, you know, one or two men got through a door or something, but now suddenly they're in, and of course the defenders start to panic, and within minutes um, the town is completely engulfed by the Cromwellian attackers. And while Cromwell didn't give the order to attack, he didn't give the order to, to retreat or to, to be, to be uh, you know, not to commit atrocities, uh, if you want to call them atrocities, and may rephrase that sentence, um, not to, certainly not to involve any civilians. So, so 1500 or thereabouts, and uh, not the 4000 that's mentioned in that history book that I mentioned earlier, which is complete and absolute nonsense. Uh, defenders lost their lives at Wexford. Now, this is where it becomes a little muddy, and it's it's a lot. Wexford is is uh, more or less the same. It's di difficult to defend because we know, and there is a contemporary source that tells us that a lot of the, when the attackers were coming into the town, that some of the boats, because it's, it's a maritime area, boats are just on the, on the harbour, the defenders, or the attackers are coming in, they have heard stories about Drogheda, so the boats are filled up so that they can try to get away, they go over the Slaney River to try and get away, and they were filled up too much, and some women in those boats we know drowned. And we know that happened. That's not a, um, a, anything that we can gloss over. But it's certainly not so. It is certainly is something that we can say didn't happen on purpose. Wasn't part of the policy. And 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 anyway. So uh, we can take exactly the same mantra about Wexford. And that mantra is that no. So, uh, uh, eyewitnesses give us any details whatsoever about civilian deaths at Wexford. The massacre did ensue, 1,500 defenders lost their lives. Um, and again, if we take all these things in complete isolation, we think, oh my God, this is horrendous. This was a time of war, where war was happening all over the country, both in Ireland and in England. And uh, it, it doesn't seem as, as atrocious in, in that context. But I can well, say, say, and you can ask me another question about Wexford, Wexford if you like, but I can say, following, following Wexford uh, and following, following the, the winter break, the, the reason Cromwell sat down to write, to write that document that we mentioned um, much, uh, much earlier, where there are 10 occasions where he denies, uh, where he, he uh, insists that civilians um, are not to be part of the war. Um, the reason he did sit down and write that document was because um, the Catholic clergy, uh, and we got an idea of the mindset that Cromwell has towards them earlier on, the Catholic clergy decide to convene a comic noise, and there um, they realize they're losing the war. They realize that the Royalist Army, and it's the Royalist Army, um, are not up to um, the, 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 the level that Cromwell is currently, um, you know, the, the, the level of warfare that he's currently displaying. So they try and rally the whole country by printing a couple of documents and sending them countrywide to just generate, um, you know, hatred for Cromwell and try and, uh, you know, stir anybody who has a conscience just to join us, join us. We can't let this English commander destroy the country. The point I'm making here is that Okay, it, it really annoyed Cromwell that that because uh, we come to that in a second. Um, but in that document, they didn't say, which is massive. They didn't say that he killed any civilians, which I think is phenomenal. Because if three and a half thousand civilians had died at Drogheda and four thousand, however many it is, whatever the numbers are, and I realise you asked me a question earlier about the numbers. We come to the numbers. Um, remind me to come to the numbers. Um, if any number of civilians had been killed at either Drogheda or Wexford, this was the time that the Catholic clergy would have mentioned it. You know, and this is another piece of evidence. You know, you could take all these pieces of evidence and combine them, and you think, why? How could we even be told that civilians were killed on mass? This is complete lunacy. Would you like me to go back and deal with the the uh, question that you asked me at the very beginning about the 3,000, 2,700 um, civilians, army, whatever it was in Drogheda? Would you like me to do that now? Yeah, sure. Um, it's just, you know, by no means am I a dishonest Englishman, and I don't believe Oliver Cromwell was either. Um, obviously, as you said, this was a time of war, um, and, and we're using Wexford as an example. If things, you know, if atrocities were committed, then... You know, I believe we're perfectly fine at admitting that. Um, it's just what, where I cause an issue or bring issue in is to where, you know, like we've discussed today, that it isn't actually true and there isn't actually any 
concrete evidence of that um, and just numbers are just thrown around willy-nilly to try and you know make it sound worse than what it actually was so it'd be yeah just with their numbers just because they're very specific numbers aren't they they're very large yeah. numbers um yeah. and they're just yeah. you know and it's very easy to just say 3500 in all innocent <laughs> you know yeah, yeah, and and, and and just so, so on the numbers. So just, just, we mentioned John Morrill earlier on. If, any, if nobody knows, you should Google John Morrill. He is the foremost Cromwellian expert in the world. But as I mentioned before, he sent me a private email agreeing with me, and then he decided against that, which is fine. John and I are fine. Um, I think fundamentally, I hope I he is with me. Anyway, um, but the point is, he number juggles about Gahar specifically, and the only like I, I, the first couple of sentences sentences that I'm going to say kind of negates number juggling straight away because we also know that Gahar there is an account where um, uh, an eyewitness says that many um, soldiers who were found in houses and disarmed at Drogheda were not killed. They were allowed to go on their way. Many. I'm just using that word many. But we also know because the escapees um, went to nearby Trim, which was where Lord Inchiquin was, and he also uses the word many. Many have come in from Drogheda and they tell of stories of atrocities and uh, military. So um, my point is, yes, we know the composition, the number of the of the defending army, you know, about two and a half thousand to three thousand, roughly. We don't know the exact number. Um, but when you lose control of those people, you don't know where they were. You have some accounts where there's a guy called Hugh Peter, who is Cromwell's um, chaplain. And now we also happen to know that he wasn't even in Drogheda, so he's not an eyewitness. But he decides to give us a number, and it's a very specific number um, of, of the dead. And I'll mention what he says now in a second. He, he gives us a number of 3,552. Now, he calls them the enemy. In a military campaign, of course they're the enemy. You can't extrapolate that or decide to say some of those were civilians, all of them were civilians. I mean, it's very clear. If you join, the, if you're in the army, you're in the army. Or if you're if you're fighting, you're fighting. You know, if you're not, you're not. You're either a teenager, a pensioner, a, 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 you know, a toddler, um, you know, whatever you are, an auntie, an uncle, a granny, a granddad. You know, this, 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 that word civilian. This is what really bothers me, Marcus, about these historians who just keep using the word civilian. They don't differentiate between those who were armed, and they were both at Bada and Wexford, and those who weren't armed. Putin, at this moment, is killing civilians who are not armed, who are not involved in the conflict, and that's an atrocity. And you can't say the same about Cromwell, on yes, unless you're biased and you're speculating, because that's all we can do. And you talk about you know the, 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 the defenders of Wexford and Wexford in context, anything else uh, you know, when it comes to civilian atrocities, is speculation. Of course it may have happened. Absolutely it may have happened. But my God, stop teaching children lies, because that's what we're still doing. And as I say, you know, this, this it, it, it inflames Irish hearts, and it's, it's completely wrong. No, you're completely right there, and thank you very much for covering that. Um, just to make a quick U-turn, because again, I am, I am conscious of the time, um, should we yeah. move on to something that's um looked you know in in a better light upon by the irishman we've got um the siege of clonmel where um <laughs> apparently we actually lost 2000 roundheads um 